Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shane Carter. I'm the president of Sony Music Canada. Uh, I'm here today to welcome you to the 2015 Music Canada AGM. Uh, I would like to uh, point out uh, someone in the room and welcome Jeffrey Remedius, the new president and CEO of Universal Music. Congratulations, Jeffrey. And uh, a couple of other former um, board members. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Randy Lennox and his contribution to Music Canada. We wish him the best of luck at Bell Media. And uh, I'm thrilled to see Dean Cameron over there uh, with his new post at Massey, Massey Hall and Roy Thompson. I think we're all really excited about that. So congratulations to Dean. Today we're going to be talking about music cities, uh, from what's happening in our own backyard uh, to the global best practices. Uh, I'd like to now welcome Graham Henderson, the president of Music Canada, to the stage uh, to introduce a very special guest. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, special day for us today here for a lot of different reasons. Um, everybody who's uh, from Toronto or from the vicinity knows that uh, Toronto is without doubt one of the world's great music cities. Um, and this is in a large part due to uh, the organic, um, homegrown efforts of people in this room. Um, but since our 2012 report, uh, which uh, sort of took Austin as an example of some best practices and then compared to Toronto, made a bunch of recommendations, we've seen the city of Toronto come to the table uh, in an unprecedented manner. Uh, we now, for example, have the Toronto uh, Music uh, Advisory Council, Music Industry Advisory Council, Mike Canner, uh, right there. Uh, he's our dedicated uh, music industry officer. That's a huge step forward. Uh, we have our ongoing alliance uh, with the city of Austin. Uh, and of course, and perhaps most importantly, uh, we have our own music-friendly mayor. Um, and a problem solver, I might add, for our community. Uh, many of you who are veterans of South by Southwest in Austin uh, will probably have been very impressed uh, to see our mayor and his wife Barbara out every single evening till late, late, late at night in Austin uh, after having spent days brimming with official meetings. It was absolutely extraordinary to see. He was indefatigable uh, and, uh, and uh, it was uh, a, a very welcome. Uh, so this is a, a welcome change, I think, for our city uh, and uh, for the music industry. And uh, I'm thrilled uh, to introduce the one and only uh, the man that other cities want to have and can't have, Mayor John Tory. I should say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that um, uh, it was only because Barb was there that I was out late into the early into the morning hours uh, seeing music. I saw some music that I'd never seen before, and you'll know, obviously, from my uh, faux pas that it didn't do much for my knowledge when I claimed that Kanye West was one of our own, but you know what? <laughs> we made the best of it, and we put a video online that I think so hundreds of thousands of people subsequently yeah. saw, so you know, this is probably better than other videos that have been online before, but never mind. <laughs> That's for another day. Well, uh, um, I just want to give a little background uh, to folks to, uh, uh, before we go into the questions. During the campaign, your campaign for mayor, uh, I received a call from your campaign team uh, very, very early on in the process indicating that the uh, then candidate uh, would be interested in meeting with, uh, with me and, uh, and others at Music Canada uh, to, help, uh, to help him formulate a music platform. Uh, and, of course, uh, that was uh, a terrific uh, <laughs> idea. Um, it was unique, uh, and it led to a meeting at our offices. You brought a whole, I mean, there must, you must have brought four people, uh, and we sat almost for two hours uh, and walked through all of our dreams and aspirations, all of the history of the Toronto Austin Music Report. Uh, the mayor, or then candidate, took copious notes, 
And then, and then a little while later, uh, we got a call uh, in which we were asked if we could facilitate uh, the mayor making his jobs announcement at Canada Music Week, and it contained a very significant component related specifically to the music industry. Uh, it uh, was a music platform that talked about uh, a standalone music office. Uh, it talked about music tourism uh, and enhanced live performances and festivals. Um, so that was terrific. You then became elected and you're now about nine months into your mandate. Um, are you optimistic? Is it only that long? <laughs> it seems longer. Pan Am would do that to you. Yeah. I'm very optimistic and I want you to know I'm here uh, to demonstrate and I know that you can show up places and you can speak words and you know actions speak louder than words but I'm very committed to this and I'll tell you why and, I, and it was uh, reinforced for me in spades when I went to Austin and even going there was again an indication of my desire not just to show my commitment but to learn and what I learned there that I think was um, was really important to bring back here was two things. One, when the city was fully committed to every aspect of music and the performance of music and to the attraction of musicians uh, to the city that they got great things done in terms of what they've uh, evolved over time there. And secondly, that it had gigantic uh, economic benefits for the city that went way beyond the jobs created by the music industry uh, and, and, and uh, spoke to the whole question of even the attraction of uh, global companies, technology companies, and so on. We went out as part of the same trip, and Mike, of course, was along, and we went out to see Google, and we went to see uh, IBM, and, and we, we said, well, of all the places you could pick in the United States where you might make very substantial investments, why would you pick Austin? Because that's no slam on Austin. It's just a city of six or 700,000 people that is unremarkable relative to other American cities. And they said, you know, there was something about the sort of secret sauce of the kind of people who were attracted by the music and by the commitment to uh, culture and so on in Austin. And, and you know, they, they talked quite a bit joking, half jokingly about the T-shirts that say "Keep Austin Weird," but that that was a big factor in them locating their investments where they thought they were the kind of people they wanted to hire, and that it had this kind of, you know, circular relationship. And so. I came back knowing that we essentially had to do, you know, two things. I mean, I, I learned from the kind of research that I did as a candidate and what I knew. I have a son who uh, works for Live Nations and he's, he's went to music school and is very musical. And so I've learned from a lot of different people who've, who've coached me and helped me that we have here, you know, all of the ingredients. I mean, we have all the ingredients. We have the ingredients that probably existed as well, although I'm not even sure to the same mature extent, in film. Um, when Toronto wasn't a film capital, either in terms of production or in terms of things like TIFF. I suspect the music infrastructure, if I can call it that, the human infrastructure is actually way ahead of where it was in film 30 years ago. What we haven't done, which we did with film, uh, maybe after, uh, as we develop the infrastructure, is to kind of pull it together, give the support from the government in two ways. One is to support uh, by way of uh, you know, helping make opportunities available, helping to showcase, uh, helping to uh, facilitate things, helping to modernize regulations, and, and secondly, helping by sort of getting out of the way. Um, because a lot of the times I think there have been, you know, rules and offices and inspectors and various other people who, if you're really committed to being Music City, you have to sort of put your money where your mouth is without sacrificing the public interest in a broader sense. And so I sort of stand here, sit here uh, as committed, Graham, you know, today more committed because I've now seen another place where they made a success and we're not going to be Austin, we're different. Yeah. Um, but I'm encouraged by the, and I think what we have to do is deliver for you because there are people, and I went out during uh, Music Week um, and saw some of the performances going on in different venues there. I've heard of some of Michael Hollett's plans for next year. All of this is good, but we've got to sort of, you know, put our energy uh, with, with Mike, uh, perhaps getting some more help. Uh, behind uh, making uh, some of this stuff happen, whether it's modernizing regulations or even just putting regulations in place that clearly define noise, um, you know, noise uh, tolerance levels, uh, whether it's making more venues available, whether it's showcasing artists, which we're going to do at City Hall. Uh, this coming year, we're actually going to have a concert series inside the City Hall, inside meaning because when the weather's not so good to do it outside, we'll do it inside. And we're going to have things that are regular features that we do that showcase our artists. Um, and on it goes. But uh, I want to hear, as I said to you upstairs, from some of the people here about things that, that they haven't s seen getting done or getting addressed that they think should be. Because I'm very determined at the end of four years, forget about the fact there's an election, I don't care. It's just when my term happens to be up that we can look back and say, we actually got something down here and moving us towards being what we are in film and what we can be for sure in music.
Yeah, and I think uh, I think that's a, that's very important uh, to have uh, a mayor and a mayor's office and a government that is open to the community. Um, there's lots of different ways we can help. I mean, one of the things that you've done to facilitate this was to uh, uh, to ensure that the Toronto Music Advisory Council was uh, put into place. Um, how how do you feel that's working? I think it's working fine and that we have people from different elements of the music business sitting on the advisory committee. I think the usual challenge in business, but even more so I assure you in government, having been in both now nine months in government and, and quite a few years in business, is that things happen faster in business. So for a whole bunch of reasons I think all of you will understand. Um, but I think in government the wheels of government often grind quite slowly. And so it's taking time that I have to learn to be patient with, although not too patient, with the sort of translation from advice uh, to action. And I think what I've tried to do in the meantime on a kind of a granular basis uh, with the help of people like Mike and others is to sort of make sure we set a bit of an example. So when confronted with uh, some postering problems uh, last year, yeah. uh, we just said, look, uh, you know, we can't go on this way. And, and I think it made a change that I think is positive. When confronted by a festival, an acoustic guitar festival, I forget the name of it now, that was being held in the park and somebody was saying this was outrageous because it was going to cause noise problems from acoustic guitars, we just sat down with the parks people and we worked it out so that they could have their festival. It was kind of not really a viable kind of concern that anybody had to begin with. And so I think that, that and I tried with a couple of successes and a couple of failures uh, during the uh, Music Week, there was a, you know, I guess one proposal to close the street. We never really got that done, but we certainly did succeed in producing an alternate venue right there. Uh, I, th I don't think it ended up getting used. But the bottom line is that I've sort of indicated a willingness on the part of the mayor and the mayor's office to go to bat on these things to help Mike, because he's, he's, he's got, got a big job to do for one guy. And I think when, it, when you start at the top to show that you're committed. So I think that what we've got to do is, I, and I want to hear from the group in here, um, you know, um, the Music Advisory Committee has quite sensibly divided things into different segments that have to do with regulatory and have to do with venues and a whole lot of different things. I'd love to hear of things you don't think you see any sense of getting done at all, um, or things where you think that uh, even I have been too patient with this so s slowly grinding wheel, and that I should get more impatient and start to sort of beat my shoe on the table. Now the problem is I'll be beating it for <laughs> at him. He doesn't really deserve that, but having said all that, I got to beat it at somebody. So, uh, but I really want to hear from people in a few minutes when we finish our discussion. Well, that's, so I think the mayor's, by the way, uh, very interested actually in doing that. So when we finish chatting here, we'll, we'll you, if you have a question or you've got a suggestion, please. Uh, think of it now and, and then put it to them. I, I think that um, uh, one of the things in, in the studies that, that we at Music Canada have done, one of the things that's come out of these studies is the surprising degree to which red tape, uh, which we tend to associate with other businesses, actually impacts the ability of music and maybe music more than some other businesses uh, to be, uh, you know, to conduct their business and to flourish and thrive. And around the world now, this is an idea that's kind of taking root, that, it, it, that obviously, you know, financial support for the industry is important, but untying red tape, looking for these opportunities, the postering, uh, you know, bylaw and, and how you've handled that I think is a good example, but there, there are so many of these that, that need to be, uh, to be dealt with. Well, I look, at, I look at Austin, and you know, the, again, I talked about learning down there, and I was kind of, again, interested and amazed at the venues, how they sort of took over the whole of the downtown area, including some of the very largest venues that were very close to condominium buildings. And so when I asked about this, I said, well, you know, what do you do about those people over there uh, that live over there? They said, well, first of all, I guess when they bought their condos, because the building was relatively recent, as are many here, they bought it with the knowledge that there had been for a number of years venues that were close by. But they also had gone to the length of saying that some of the building standards in the particular building I'm thinking of now, it's close to the one, one of the largest venues right downtown, I can't remember the name. Stubs had standards that allowed for certain kinds of glass or required certain kinds of glass to be put on those buildings so that it reduced the chances of people mm -hmm. being you know unduly upset by by uh, by the music which which uh, was being performed so I just think again um, it starts with yes uh, having a sort of a regulatory framework that is better defined and better accommodating of music but it also starts with an administration and the red tape part of yeah. this that says you know we're going to find a way to say yes as opposed to automatically saying no yeah. And I think that's going to be big, and I think the proof of the pudding really will start to come next year, um, you know, with some of the plans people have to do yeah. various things that are going to be a little bolder, because we've got to be bolder. I mean, we have to find places to do, bigger places to do more things, and some of those bigger places where we're going to do more things are going to be close by where people live. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to say, look, um, 
you know, it's not going to be every day and it's not going to be all night, but it's going to be some days uh, because that's all part of building a great city. And so, yes, red tape is a big part of this uh, and, and making sure that we take what I'll call a pragmatic approach that says we have to respect the fact people live there, but we also have to respect the fact we're trying to build up the music industry. And I think you can do both. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, by the way, Mayor, that uh, one of, I mean, certainly from my perspective, and I think for a lot of people in the community, the fact that your first uh, business trade mission uh, was a music-related trade mission to Austin was uh, uh, an incredible signal to our community about the value that you ascribe to it and the potential for it. And I know that coming out of I that... I just mentioned, Graham, mm -hmm. that two, two things came out of that that are yep. very tangible. You Maybe that's where you're going. Yeah, One was. is a business summit where they're bringing 60, I think, business people up uh -huh. here uh -huh. that are business people. I mean, it's not really directly related to the music industry, but because we established this initial relationship founded on music, they're bringing 60 business people up here and you can't tell me that when they bring 60 people up they don't think there's a reason to do that. Mm -hmm. No, they want to sell us stuff but we want to sell them stuff too so there's going to be benefits to us out of that. And secondly, there's going to be a music summit specifically that's yeah. going to happen early next year uh, where there will be a big focus on performers and on things we can do together as industries um, to you know work together and showcase music. So mm -hmm. those are two things that are actually going to happen. They're not just nice statements on a piece of right. paper. Yeah, and I, I and I believe that the, the 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 mission that's coming up with all those business folks is coming is sponsored by the Austin Chamber of Commerce. It is, and they don't do a lot of these ones. No. But the but the the what, when we were down there, we sort of looked at their materials that they prepared. I mean, they're hugely professional. They're heavily invested in these, and they've chosen to come to Toronto. So I mean, there's a very positive outcome, and music's a key part of that. And I should say, uh, you know, I also noticed, just so you know, I noticed these things when I was there the complete commitment they made, and there's been no proposal put in front of me yet, because I'm the sort of mayor who also said I was going to get traffic moving in the city. <laughs> but, you know, when push came to shove, I supported TIFF, for example, and them asking to close down King Street on a weekday, including the streetcars, because I felt when you looked at this, that is the, if you did it in a kind of proper, well-prepared way, that you could benefit from, you know, what TIFF's all about, and not have too big a price to be paid in terms of the traffic and people moving to go to work. And I think it worked fine. And similarly, I saw when I was in Austin that basically the entire downtown was closed um, for the South by Southwest and that, you know, we're going to have to make some decisions in that regard. We're either serious about this or we're not. And so my job is to sort of make sure that I am not talking into both sides of my mouth, but that I have my cake and eat it too, that we keep people moving in the city, but that at the same time we say if part of what we have to do is, I mean, Michael Hall, I remember telling me, what a hassle he had at Young Dundas Square with just closing down the street, I think, because he had the crowds that were, you know, in excess of the size of the square. Well, I mean, it, and it was on a weekend. We'll, we'll, we'll get over, I mean, dealing with that traffic as long as we have lots of notice and can plan it because I'll stand behind him and stand behind other people like yourselves in making that kind of thing happen if we have the time to do it properly mm -hmm. because then we can have people still moving and have the music at the same time. Um, one example that's sort of near and dear to my heart of, of something that's important to this city that's uh, in, the, in the throes of a, a, a reimagining is Massey Hall. Uh, and I know you, I believe you came out to uh, the uh, announcement of the, uh, the, the plans to, uh, uh, to uh, reinvent it and reimagine it. What, what are your thoughts about Massey? Well, I mean, it's a jewel, and it, 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 I, I thank goodness that the governments have come up with the money they have, and they have a lot of money yet to raise from the private sector mm -hmm. to refurbish that to the state, to, to the state that it, it should be in. But I would put a challenge out more broadly. That one is one that happens to be, I'll call it in private hands, in that it's a separate corporation that exists and runs the two, uh, two halls. But we also have these three theaters, and we've just taken a step, and by the three theaters, I mean the Sony Center, the uh, St. Lawrence Center, and the uh, North York, it's called the Toronto Center for the Performing Arts. We've taken a typical timid step, although it's very sensible, to now bring those three together and kind of run them as one. But that doesn't change what goes on inside, and it doesn't change the level of activity, which is not what it needs to be to have those things, not even necessarily financially viable, although that would be nice, but to have them viable in the context of being fully utilized performance venues. And I would say to you, that put it to, out to you, if you have some ideas on how we can use those halls and make use of those as part of the process of turning us into more of a music capital, we're all ears. I mean, if we just go on and all we've done is combine three theaters into one and had one board of directors instead of three, we'll save a little bit of money out of that, but we won't achieve anything. 
and I'm, we're, we're relying on you. I think the ideas are going to come from, you know, from the creative community to tell us how to use those theaters better. They're great assets. Nobody's suggesting we sell any of them or close them or tear them down. They're suggesting we find ways to use them better, and those ideas are not going to come from the government. Government yeah. is not a source of too many good ideas on many things, mm -hmm. um, but, but they can be the catalyst to make things happen that are good ideas that come from you. Mm. And so I would hope Massey Hall, even Thompson Hall, though it's a more complicated, yeah. you know, uh, you know, facility, and, but, but the other three are places where if you have ideas, I can assure you that we are delighted to hear them and eager to hear them because we don't, at the moment, I've not heard anybody that's sort of saying they've got this figured out. Well, maybe this is our opportunity to seek suggestions from the audience if they have any. Um, you've had ample warning. The mayor is here. Josh, you can't make suggestions. That's Councillor Josh Cole. Oh, I hadn't realized you were here, Josh. I didn't see you <laughs> walk in. Well, yeah. And look, I'm blessed, by the way, by, because I, as you can tell from my comments about Mr. West, uh, I know very little about, I mean, I know what I know, and I know what I like, and it's all from 25 years ago, probably, but um, <laughs> it's just my age. I've got Josh, I've got Gary Crawford, I've got John Fillion. I mean, these are people and others who are really committed to making something happen. And, yeah. and I think when you have three or four members of the council, and you have somebody like Mike who are committed to make things happen, that's what you need to sort of get around some of this inertia that exists in government. And so I want you to know if you come up with the suggestions, we will, because we have a critical mass of people who want to push this forward, including myself, we'll make stuff happen. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we've tried to show that in tiny ways um, with things like postering and things like some of the venues that were in question uh, this summer and so on. But we've got to get to sort of the bigger picture. And a lot of it will have to do with how we can be more hospitable to musicians as well, because ah. it's not all about just the industry right. and the venues and the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's about what we can be doing to be more hospitable to musicians. And that extends all the way through to, I'm proud of the fact that even since I've been the mayor, we've approved two or three uh, developments and I've gone to some of the announcements of those developments that include, for example, some affordable housing for artists, which yeah. includes musicians. You may say, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I mean, it all fits part of the puzzle that you've got to be a hospitable home to musicians who often yeah. might be in need of that sort well, of thing. Well, I think we have to be mindful uh, about that uh, because Austin, uh, you, as you may know, just completed a census of its community which was designed to answer the question, okay, $1.6 billion, uh, huge economic impact. It, how is this benefiting? We know how it's benefiting the city. We know how it's benefiting the music community. How is it doing for musicians? And I think the results were a little alarming, uh, that maybe the musician, musicians themselves were not benefiting uh, in ways that uh, one might have expected considering the volume sheer dollar volume that was, was uh, involved. So to hear from you, uh, you know, we always like to say that, remind that music friendly is one thing, musician friendly is another. And so coming from you, Mr. Mayor, that's very important. So come on now, I was me that said to Graham that I was just scheduled to sit up here and blather on as I've successfully done for the last 15 minutes uh, under his expert tutelage. But um, there must be some things like, well, you haven't mentioned this and you should have, or we've, you know, a big problem in the city is this, or I, I want to listen today because I learned in Austin, but I can learn a lot here too. So who, you're not shy of retiring people, I know that. Well, obviously you are. <laughs> there. Uh, I'm really happy to hear Graham mention you know, the part of the musicians, uh, obviously. Uh, I, I believe that the ideas that you put forward are absolutely excellent. I think building this music community is, is an excellent idea. I'd like to compare it to an ecosystem as well. You know, in, in any environment, you have an ecosystem, and, and at the root of this particular ecosystem are the musicians. And if you, if you trim the leaves too much, and if you take too much of the fruit and not allow the ecosystem will die. Uh, unfortunately, as the president brought up a very interesting point in you know, well, what is the benefit of Austin for musicians? Unfortunately, the very bad part about Austin is that it, it is the greatest exploitation and infringement of copyright of musicians in the world. It is absolutely ridiculous that way. And I just pray to God that when you bring this kind of environment here, well, thank you. That's the kind of input that I need to have. And it may be that we could take that as a point of pride, unlike other places, without being critical of Austin or anywhere else, that, that we actually can create a music city where we do respect 
the intellectual and creative properties of artists uh, in a way that perhaps others don't and succeed nonetheless because it's, it's not an either or situation at all. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, one way to do that, for example, is just to ensure, for example, that all city facilities that play music uh, are up to date with their SOCAN fees and or resound fees. I don't know whether there's ever been a study of that, but that might be some place to start because it could just be that there's some gaps. Oh, it would be a very yeah. good place to start, you know, mm -hmm. to make sure we're setting an example in that yeah. regard. Other suggestions, other comments? I mean, if there were things we could do, because oftentimes the hardest part to address when you're sitting in a government office is it's easy to address industries and venues and regulations, but it's hardest to actually reach that individual musician. Mm -hmm. And maybe Austin is evidence of the fact that mm -hmm. they've been wildly successful in one respect, but maybe not as successful in the other. And we just heard one that had to do with respect for creative um, intellectual property. But also, what else is there that we could be doing to create that sort of environment that will make this a mecca? It already is to some extent, mm -hmm. but to make sure it can continue to be more of a mecca for individual artists to be here and to make their living here and produce here. Go ahead, Josh. <laughs> uh, I know one thing the mayor loved was uh, the program during Pan Am uh, on the stage in Naperville Square. It's a beautiful new stage. And more than a question to the mayor, but I think uh, uh, a plea he will make. I know one thing the mayor loved was uh, the program during Pan Am uh, on the stage in Naperville Square. It's a beautiful new stage. And more than a question to the mayor, but I think uh, a plea he will make a public degree in many, many instances is that we need partners. You know, just let me follow up on that because I'm really glad you mentioned that. I, I don't know, I'll bet you very few people in this room have been to the Agra Khan Museum and you should go and see it. It is one of the most magnificent things architecturally but also from the standpoint of landscape architecture that you'll ever see in the city of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And it's been built by the Ismaili faith, but they want it to be a public park in that sense. It's, it's, a, it's a different public park because they paid for it, they're going to operate it. But I sat next to Prince Amin, who's the Aga Khan's brother, the other night, and on the other side, the head of the Ismaili kind of faith in Canada. And their biggest concern at the moment is to program that space. And so we got chatting about what Nick DiDonato did at Casa Loma, where he put in, it just shows you again the audience that's out there for music, especially in the summer. But he uh, put Monday nights were kind of... Uh, easy listening kind of music. Tuesday nights were classical and he, he hired some kind of a symphonic group to play. They had a thousand people out a night at Casa Loma. In Casa Loma, there wouldn't have been a thousand people there over a, week, a series of weeknights and they were just there to tour through the old musty you know, corridors and he, the Liberty Group are investing in fixing the place up. But it just showed me that when you put something like that and made an offering to people, said come to Casa Loma in a beautiful garden setting there, listen to music, they would buy dinner if they wanted to, but you didn't have to, and you could buy a drink. They had a thousand people a night, and they carried it on for an entire month and a half, more so than they thought because of the demand. And I said to uh, the prince, and, and the, they, because they're concerned, they're, they're, they're impatient because they think that people should have been flocking to this park by now, and indeed, if people knew what it looked mm -hmm. like and knew what it was like, they would. It, people will flock to it because it's programmed. And both inside and outside that museum, there are clever people in this room who could say, here's how you should program it next summer so we don't miss the opportunity to take up. And, and I guarantee you, anybody who went to see a music performance of any kind in that park would come back there again and again and again because it's such a magnificent setting and it's very close to transportation and they'll enjoy, obviously, the music. So we need people that are partners and clever people to come up with these kinds of concepts. And that's a really good example of a place that doesn't happen to be a public park. It's also probably a fairly benign venue because it's not surrounded on all sides by condos. It's right, it's sort of next to the parkway, but not in a way that's obtrusive, but it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of in a place where you could put on something outside and you're not gonna have a lot of complaints about it. So we're all ears about that there. They'd love to, if any of you wanna partner with them, come and tell me and I'll hook you up with them because they're delighted to hear ideas like that. And even if it's a one-off thing, I mean, they want to try things that, that, that are, I mean, I don't think they want to have, uh, you know, an alternative rock uh, thing necessarily <laughs> there, but I think, uh, they, I think they, they're pretty open to sort of doing almost anything that will get people to come and, and see and experience this park and the museum. Who else? Ideas, criticisms, suggestions? The criticisms I'll direct to Mike, of course, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Over there. Yeah. 
question about where you want to see this in four years. You talked about performance and on stage. It's in the fall. We talked about that a little more. What you see has changed at the end of that first four years for you. What does the city look like now from where we are today? Yeah, I went to see something a couple of weeks ago, and again, it's an indication of my interest in this, and I went to see, was it called Coalition? Yep. Uh, and, and, and there, I think it, it could be referred to kind of as, a, as an incubator of sorts, and it was fascinating because they've got their business going on on the main floor where they represent artists and do various things. And then upstairs, I went to see this, um, not only, I actually saw some of these young, young well, they, everybody's young compared to me, but young, younger musicians taking the course that goes on for a number of weeks, uh, and the day that uh, I was there, they had a guy in from the States who was talking to them about the sort of psychology of being on stage and having a stage presence and so on. It was quite, uh, it was quite interesting even for a politician to listen to. And then I saw the downstairs where they have those facilities that are available for people to record and they, they can showcase artists for people to come and watch them and see, you know, talent development and so on. And I was amazed at where it was and that it works because it's, it, it's, it's kind of not in a location that's right downtown. It's kind of at Victoria Park and Lawrence or whatever. Um, but it does. And, and so I'm not saying that's the model, but I'm saying that I think we need to have more places like that. They mm -hmm. are probably going to succeed mm -hmm. better if they represent some collaboration between the public sector, probably through our education system or, or you know, through mm -hmm. music education, the private sector through pure private sector entrepreneurs and uh, musicians and music talent. And uh, so again, I would flip that kind of question back to you and say, and by the way, to answer your question of what I'd like to see at the end of four years, being realistic about this, knowing that you're not going to instantly transform the city into this kind of shining music city on the hill in four years any more than you did film. I mean, film took a period of time. Is I would like to see us accomplish the following. First of all, have a real focus on this inside the government so that we can you know, quickly clear out of the way obstacles, as we do, I think, by and large, for film. We've got to the stage of maturity now as a government where it's almost to the stage where people like Josh and I have to answer for how come film can get their way on everything, because there are people who then complain to us about roads being closed and this and that. But I think we have to move much more in the direction of being music friendly in that sense, and I'd like to have people say there's no question that our government at City Hall is doing that. I would like to see us uh, have developed some additional venues of, of, of substantial size so that we can put on uh, bigger events and have resolved or addressed the issues that go with those, including the noise and other kinds of issues, because there's no question we have a variety of different places we could do these things. Um, I would like to see us have addressed in a more granular way as well some of the smaller venues and making sure they can coexist in the city, because right now you know there are issues that are going on as we speak in different parts of town. Um, and, and I would like to see us start to have been recognized, uh, uh, you know, as a place for music tourism and so on, which I think we are now, but I'm not sure it's something where we're putting it in the window. And then finally, I, this is the part that I'm least informed about and I'm sort of looking for input while I'm here, is how we can do something that's going to advance the interests of musicians. I mean, I realize by showcasing and having things at City Hall Square, as Josh was saying, and in the City Hall, and it's all about showcasing Toronto artists, mm -hmm. that's going to start, that's going to help. By having incubators that work on a model, whether it's the coalition type model or something mm -hmm. else, that's going to help. But I want to make sure there are not other things I'm not thinking about. And look, with the kind of expert help I get from Mike and from Josh, I think we hear about them, but that's why I want to ask you the same thing. So I'd like to see us well along um, to having the basic fundamentals in place such that we can then build up the reputation and know that the fundamentals are behind it. Cooperative government, uh, hospitable regulations, venues to play, um, you know, and so on that are the building blocks because I'm not sure we even sort of had those um, inadequate supply before. Uh, I mean, one way to deal with the um, the last point about ensuring that musicians, uh, I mean, is, to, is, is what does the city have in its control? What can the city do? I mean, one thing, you know, uh, there's always a call for musicians to perform at this event or that event. If the city had a budget, like a segregated budget that you could draw down on uh, every time a musician performed, and in fact, you could create opportunities for musicians to perform to showcase the city. Not, you know, and, and what we have on offer, that might be something. Well, one of the things I had already mentioned, I think I mentioned this to, to Mike, and I certainly, when, when I travel, um, one of, you know, and I'm going to travel, notwithstanding that I get harsh criticism from Mr. Ford and others about this, because <laughs> I think you have to go out and sell the city, and especially maybe sell the fact that we have 
well, never mind. But, <laughs> um, but, but I want to take with me, yes, business people, but I also want to take academics with me, and I want to take artists. And the artists that it's usually going to be easiest to take to actually showcase the talent, I mean, it's harder to take a visual artist, because what are they going to do, bring their work with them in the plane? I think it's easier to take musicians, dancers, and people like that to actually have them at a dinner we might put on to schmooze people, frankly, to say, come to Toronto and invest, come to Toronto to do business. Take you know, a musician or two, take a dancer or two, and actually have them perform. And so I would like to do that because I think that's part of showcasing what Toronto's all about. You know, just as I heard from the businesses in Austin, it's going to make those people, I think, more likely in this day and age to want to invest in Toronto um, if they know that it's a city that's deeply committed to the creative arts and to creativity and, 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 and is music and art, arts friendly. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be hugely important because they know that the employees they want to hire who are also here in abundance are people that are here partially for that reason. And so if we can illustrate that by putting an artist in front of them, I think that's going to be a good thing for the artist, it's going to be a good thing for us, and it's going to be a good thing to get them to come here as tourists or as investors. Oh, there's one more question over his comment. I'm glad that's happening. I, I should say that this will show my age, but I was there at Maple Leaf Gardens in 1965 with my sister. No, I don't. I didn't keep anything from it, but I, I have a lot of memories from it, including the fact that I heard absolutely no music because the screaming was so loud you couldn't hear a thing. It's just true. But having said that, it was great to see it all, um, and I do remember that. Uh, I, it made me think of one other thing, though, and Josh, I think, knows a little bit about this. I have reinstituted this year with my wife, Barb, because we are sort of doing it together. Um, this Mayor's Evening for the Arts, and it, it, it's, it's doing well on the goal of trying to raise a million dollars, which will go to the Toronto Arts Council and which is going to fund a program that is called Arts in the Parks. And a big part of that is going to be music in 50 parks mm -hmm. um, where we're going to provide opportunities for, I forgot to mention this earlier, for artists of different kinds, but including many musicians, mm -hmm. to perform in our public parks mm -hmm. next summer, starting next summer. And I'm hopeful that, um, you know, we know we're going to raise the money. We're pretty much there now. If you want to buy tickets, so they're still yeah. available. Um, but that's what it's going to go for, is to sort of help seed the funding for that uh, program, which I think will make a huge difference. It kind of is following on some of what we saw with Panamania, well, where there was a lot of stuff around the city. Well, that was, uh, Mayor, uh, I'm going to have to wrap up, but, yes, just on, but, but I see Holly Nimmin sitting over there, and, and when you say raising money for, uh, for the Arts Council, I think that's absolutely fantastic, but what an interesting idea. If you were going to do that yearly, yeah, um, every year. Well, then, yeah. may maybe one year you might want to think about raising some money for some music education, which really underpins everything uh, that we are. Uh, and um, I just, so I just, Holly, I just thought I, I saw you there. I, if I hadn't mentioned the, the importance of music education to all of us, I wouldn't, uh, I would have been remiss. But also, too, just hearing some of the things today and, you know, what, what Mark and, um, sorry, was it Jane? What Jane had to say. One of the things, and, it, and I think it has a lot to do with your leadership, we've always said this, we need our leaders to be vocal proponents of music. 
The fact that you have self-identified as a fan of music and a champion of music has created a set of circumstances in our city in which people are coming forward increasingly. How, how can I be part of a music city? What am I going to do to be part of a music city? It's empowering, it's, in, it's enabling, and so on. And I think, by the way, we, you were asked to give an idea of where you would be in four years. I think you gave us some incredibly concrete ideas of where you want to be. And I know that every person in this room is going to work with you to realize those goals and others. And so uh, with that, I'll thank you for all of thank your you. time. Thank and you very much. And I am very committed, and uh, I look forward to your ideas. And, and uh, Mike is there, and I, as I say, I hope we're going to get him some help because he's just uh, he's one very able and very committed guy, but he needs help. So uh, I'll look forward to working with you and make sure that at the end of the four years we can say those things got done. Thanks a lot.